<coughs> to actually, um, you know, have small holdings if that's what they want to do, or to actually have a relationship with, with local suppliers, box schemes and whatnot. So I think there is a lot more that people can perhaps find out about their local food um, and try to buy locally and not have embedded uh, carbon, buying things, you know, chickens from Brazil. We don't need chickens from Brazil in this country, we really don't. So, you know, it's those kind of issues really where we need to start looking at our own supply chain. Maybe you can all go home and have a look at where you buy your stuff from and ask questions. I, I think it's very powerful to go to the supermarket and say, where on earth does this come from? What's in that supply chain? What have you done to this animal? You know, is it cruel, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, and ask more questions. Take up more questions. Um, do you think that adding value to the agriculture industry would improve some of these problems? For instance, I think we all remember the milk price protests, mm -hmm. yeah. where um, farmers tend to receive a best about 17 pence a litre. Yeah. Whereas I think you'll obviously know when you go to the supermarket, you can pay something like 80 pence. Um, what role do you think you can play in controlling the supermarket's power over the you know, prices? Yeah, I think, I think it's an example of where the markets are working for the suppliers. It doesn't work well sometimes for the consumers as well. <coughs> so you get uh, a, a cartel, not a cartel, but a, a small group of large supermarkets that uh, cooperate. And there's a lot of lawyers in the room as well. <laughs> a, a, a small group of large supermarkets that dominate the market. You have to be sure that that market works for the consumer. It also works for the suppliers as well. If they're dominating, they're the only place where farmers can sell their milk. Then you can see they use their power, and it's a power relationship there that's not working. So this happens in a lot of different markets, and government does need to intervene. But we can't have we can't make food more expensive, but we need to make sure that the market is working well. Okay. The Very thing, quickly. Just the, the thing is, just to pick up on the point about Prince Charles, who's done a lot with the Soil Association on a plant what they call Blouse Blade. Uh, just a quick anecdote, um, I met the Chief Executive of Nottingham NHS Trust, who um, they wanted to introduce this. This is sourcing food locally and cooking it um, on the premises. They've got a big supplier doing all the food in their hospitals. Chief Executive said, I don't care what you do as long as it doesn't cost me anything. Surprisingly, it costs less. That was a surprise. And I think that um, we assume that the, the big suppliers, whatever it is, in the food, the raw food, all the supplier of, of meals in big institutions is going to be taken. In fact, it wasn't. That was the interesting thing. And a lot of places are taking out. I wanted to come back. Sorry, we've got, we haven't got a lot of time, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so, can we have the fourth question, please? Fourth question. Um, okay. Given the fall of youth involvement in politics, how do we gain some people to be rich? So, how would you engage us? Uh, well, I don't know what else you say about me. I'm flying the flag. Sorry. Over there. <laughs> Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on. No. Um, how do you engage it? I, it's interesting, actually. You see a lot of things about career politicians, and you see these people that come straight out of school and go and work for MPs and become so on. I actually didn't get involved in politics until I was in my late 20s because I was so angry at the establishment for not being able to change things that I wanted to see, and I wanted to put value in democracy. And I think that actually we need more people that are driven by what they believe in rather than driven by a party win or driven by not to go along with a party line. How do you engage young people? I try and engage people at all levels. I mean, we all hold liberal drinks in Guildford. We get a real mix of different people. But actually going out to different environments, it's very easy if you're in a political role to get stuck going around um, your village face, but actually you don't meet the people at the open mic nights, or you don't meet the people at the universities. And so you have to try and reach out to as many people as possible and find things that they can identify with and say, get involved, because ultimately you can only change things from the inside. And certainly being a Liberal Democrat, one thing that I love about my party is that I've been able to shape party policy. I was able to exact changes on the NHS bill. I was able to make sure that I could get white lines outside somebody's house so he could park there because he was disabled. And actually having that action, being able to change things within the party, locally, nationally, internationally, is a huge bonus. And the problem is that the media representation of politics, you don't see actually those small achievements or those large achievements. One thing which I've noticed is that a lot of people have been really appreciative of the television debates. So we had them in 2010, 
we had one between Nigel Farage and Nick Clegg a month ago or so. But David Cameron doesn't seem too keen on them, and they seem to engage a lot of young people. But David Cameron doesn't seem too keen on getting engaged in that sort of Well, Nick, Nick Clegg challenged Nigel Farage to the, to the debate, so it, it's not been on offer. Um, I think. You know, the, the stories, if I believe the newspapers, which I don't very often, but have suggested that David Cameron says he wants to do one debate with Ed Miliband and then one with the three main parties, and then so different debates for different forms. I don't know that young people do. I think um, if you ask me, I actually <clears throat> feel quite old. I went into politics when I was well over 40. If you said to me at 40 that I'd get involved in politics, I would have said you were completely mad. It was nothing could have been further from my mind. What you have to do, first of all, is you have to talk in a language that people understand. One of my, no disrespect, one of my hate words is the word engage, because nobody goes to the pub and engages with people. <laughs> you listen to people, you talk to people, you meet people, you knock on the doors, you chat to people. You have to use language, and I think one of my frustrations with politicians is they use words that ordinary people don't use, and they talk in a language. And it's actually very contagious, and all of us are in danger of catching it. Because you read lots of stuff from the party. If you're in government, you read lots of stuff from civil servants. And it's not what the general public um, talk about. I think, it's, um, I think it's involving people in a debate about their everyday lives. So it's about not talking about politics. It's saying, you know, people, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, actually. People say, well, you know, I don't think I know very much about politics. Well, if you catch a bus, if you go to the skate park, if you go to cinema, if you go to the theatre, if you're unemployed, if you're paying benefits, you know something about politics. Because these politicians are making decisions about all those things, locally or nationally. And it's up to all of us, because we're involved in politics, to do as Kay says, to go and talk to people, go and listen to people, and find out what matters to them and tell them how they might change it for themselves. I feel absolutely passionately why one of the reasons I went into politics is because we all hate politics and politicians at the moment, they've got a very bad reputation, but we have a democracy. It's certainly not perfect, but we do have it. And every hour of every day there is somebody around the world dying for one slice of what we've got here. So when I stand on people's doorsteps, as we all have done, and people say, oh, no, you're all the same, I'm fed up with it all, I will say to them, no, you have something that people are putting their lives on the line for. So do not waste it. We're not great, we're not perfect, and the system's not great and perfect. But it's better for most people. And I think you can inspire young people to get involved for that reason, if no other reason because we've got something quite precious, <coughs> and it's up to us to make sure that we keep it. Yeah, um, yeah just really following on from that, um, my finest hour, if you like, is um, having the young people from Egypt, the children of the leaders of the revolution, actually came to our institute, our own institute, uh, for a program during the revolution. And it was one of the most moving weeks I've ever had, because obviously they were very worried about their parents, they were worried about what happened, I'm worried about them as they've gone back to Egypt. And actually, I think it is about inspiring young people. And I think one of the biggest problems for me is I see politicians getting away with, you know, moats and flipping and all these other things. And I just think, is that really the quality of leadership that we deserve? You know, I think that's one of the problems that politicians argue amongst each other. They have these debates which have no relation to most people's lives. I think young people are worried about debt, they're worried about money, they're worried about all sorts of things like that and getting a job. And actually, I don't think those political conversations have anything to do with most people. And that's one of the issues, that it's just got nothing to do with them. And it seems there's a sort of political class or there's an elite class, and they sort of spend money like it's going out of fashion, and they really don't relate to ordinary people. So I'd like to see a reality check with politicians. I don't think we want to have rich politicians becoming much more, you have to have a lot of money to get in, etc. So I would like to see much more ordinary, everyday conversations had in the, in the corridors, and less of this um, exploitative of spending expenses. I don't think it's right that politicians should employ all their family. You can't do that in other walks of life without being told it's never to slip. So I think we need a clean-up, really, and I'd like to see more sanctions against some of the politicians and to really treat them as other jobs 
so that they actually do a decent job for us and that they have much higher standards. And I think that way, and inspiring young people. Um, I run a, a program for young people, and it's always full, and we didn't even create it. The young people come to us because they, they do a lot of the stuff in our institute in terms of their creativity, and we value young people. And I think it is about understanding that the future is young people, and we have to respect them. The future is not older people, it's younger people, and they need to be treated like that. Thank you. I think um, we'll have to sort of leave it there. Oh, let this, Richard. Oh, oh go on. I think Richard's got to leave it there. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah. Thank you. I, well, I did speak at uh, school sometimes. I spoke at a school assembly a month or so ago, and there was about 100 young people there between the ages of 11 and 16. And I had made sure that they had, they knew that if they, if you don't vote, then you basically give away your power, and politicians will be tempted and have an excuse to ignore you. Between 18 and 24 year olds, Portion of them voting at the last general election was about half of the proportion of over 65 year olds voting. And since then, we've had the EMA be, uh, education maintenance lines being scrapped, the tuition fees being trebled, but pensions have been protected and increased above inflation. We've had protection of all pensioners' benefits. So if you don't vote, you have less power and governments will be tempted to ignore you. That would be my message. And if you don't get involved in local politics and student politics, you don't have your say there either. Now, who, who knows about Chancellor's Bar being closed? Uh, any, 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 anyone agree with that? Any, any hands up to agree with it? Anyone against it? Yeah, well, it was, your, it was your representatives that decided to do that. So that's just one example of how, if you don't get involved, people are taken to ignore your views. Thank you. And one well, the way you get people involved in politics is by talking about things that concern them. And whether you like or you don't like what, what I'm here to represent, I hope you will see it's a lot more balanced than the view you get through the media. But we've got 37,000 people who've joined in the last few years who feel as though there's a message out there that they can relate to. And in talking about being ruled by a political elite, that's mostly what we have been. So the way you engage people is by actually looking at what their lives are like, not just yours, in some little bubble world that you might live in, in the, with the Westminster elite, um, where everything just gets shared out equally and everybody networks and knows each other, but by engaging real people like me, who I'm here because I'm giving up my time as a volunteer, as everyone else is here, to actually try and do something good for my community and for my country. And when people understand that, and when we think, actually, do you know what? They're not talking down, we're not being patronised. We're actually, in, they, people will engage. And you don't have to take my word for that, that's what's happening right now. This is the most exciting time to be in British politics that we have had for decades. Thank you very much for keeping it short. So the next stage of this is a question and answer session. So I ask that each candidate keeps their answer to 30 seconds maximum. And so, <coughs> does anyone have a question they'd like to ask the panel first? Anyone hasn't spoken before, so... I've asked her. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, we have. Uh, I'd like to address this question to the UK candidate. There's much talk of workers' rights. Could you please clarify your party's policy in regards to uh, the union's powers to represent the interests of the worker? There's, there's absolutely no problem. Anybody who is a legal worker in this country is entitled to the same sort of representation as anyone else. And that includes joining a union. If it's a legal, if it's a legal, you know, part of their, you know, if they're, if they're able to do it because of their job. So there's, there's not really anything much to say other than it, that would be the norm. Anyone else who'd like to join you on this? Yeah, I, I, I think. The talk at the moment is about leaving the EU, that's UK policy, I think. Unless I've got that wrong as well. I'm to engage on that. I've got to fly at 9 o'clock. And, uh, and uh, that's to get rid of the so-called red tape. Yeah, and that's to get rid of so-called red tape. And 